we're going to start actually very slowly. First of all, with some questions. Okay, a small recap from yesterday. I got to get some gifts today. Yesterday, as some of you know, I had nearly as many books as I have today here as gifts. But just two were given away um, to people who really knew some kind of answers to some kind of questions. Okay, now today, let's give it a try. Let's start again. First of all, you remember what I said. I don't want you to learn dates, but there are specific dates that I want you to know. You need to know them. And one of them is this one. I want you to tell me what happened on that, in that year. Tell me, Levi, who can tell me that? Muhammad bin Qasim. Tell me, Mansur. Tell me, tell me. Muhammad bin Qasim, what? Muhammad bin Qasim. You said something, Muhammad, Muhammad bin Qasim. Tariq bin Ziyad. What Tariq bin Ziyad? Landed in Spain. Mm. So he landed in Madrid. Yes. Excellent. Wrong. Did he go to Gibraltar? Did he go? Aha. Welcome, welcome. So he arrived in Gibraltar. Why is it called Gibraltar? No, it's Gibraltar. Huh? Yeah, Habib, listen, shall I give the gift to him or to you? Now, come on, tell me now. What? So he arrived in a place called Gibraltar. Why is it called Gibraltar? Because. Yes, yes. It means the Okay, now, 7 Eleven. Tarek bin Ziyad, Tarek, that's his name, that was Tarek. And he arrived in a place which is nowadays called Gibraltar. This is an Arabic term, this here comes from Arabic, which means Jibber, means mountain or hill or rock of Tarek. If you know Gibraltar, if you look at Gibraltar, Gibraltar is a very small place which belongs to Britain nowadays in the south of Spain. And it's actually nothing else but a rock, right? It's a rock. And for that reason, in Arabic, they called it Jibber Atari. Who called it Jibber Atari? Get it, right? No. Who? What now? That's Arabic. Jibber Atari is Arabic. So why Arabic? I started the... I'm an Arab, right? Because I started the, the lecture with a hood, with a, with a, with a du'a in Arabic. So I must be an Arab, right? No. What no? Why did I speak Arabic? Why did Gibraltar get an Arabic name? And they're not Arabs, you say. So what happened? What's happening here? Muslims took over. So Muslim. So every Muslim is an Arab, right? <laughs> no, not in those days, but if but now they yeah. take over there. Okay, go. That's an Arabic name. I started the dua, I had the dua in Arabic. Uh, the question was, why is this an Arab? Was he an Arab? No. Am I an Arab? No. Why do we do this? Why is the Arabic language important for the Muslims? Because, because it's the language of the Quran. That does not mean that we are Arabs. We don't speak Arabic now, we speak English. So I'm trying to make a point here that Tariq bin Ziyad was not an Arab, he was a Berber. Right? Berbers were the people who live in North Africa. Countries nowadays like Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, right? Libya. These are countries in North Africa. And they still have a big population of Berbers. And these Berber people were responsible for the spread of Islam in Europe. Spain, Portugal, that's the Iberian Peninsula. Okay? So he arrived in 711. Tarek his name. He gave the name to this place where he arrived, Jibber Atari. So, the Arabic language is important for the Muslims. Why? Not because the Arabic language is better than Greek. Not because the Arabic language is richer than English. No. Why is it important? It's the, the language of the Quran. But it's something that unites us guys. If I say Salaamu Alaikum to another Muslim who is not an Arab, I greet you with Salaamu Alaikum. Me, I'm Greek. I say salam alaikum to you. You're Pakistani. You're Iranian. You're whatever. I say salam alaikum. You greet me back with alaikum salam. This is a unity type of thing. We all pray together. 
And we all say the same things in Arabic. That's a, that's a thing of unity. It's not Arabization of people, as people say. Okay? That's a misconception again. That's why I want to make this clear. It's a misconception. People think that Muslims who accept Islam, even Muslims who are Muslims now, you know, who have accepted Islam, they want to look like Arabs. We're not Arabs. We don't have to be Arabs. We're Muslims. But the Arabic language is there to unite us. Okay? So that's one thing. Because of misconceptions I mentioned in this one. 7-Eleven, Gibraltar, Gibraltar. I don't know. Does anybody deserve a gift at this moment? I don't know, man. I don't know. Not really, yeah? Hmm. Okay, let's go. Next one. What is this here? I know I said days are not, I don't want you to learn days only, only. But there are some days that I mentioned yesterday that I said it's very important to know. <laughs> Thank you. What happened to Portier? Uh, the Christians fight for the Muslims. United what? and fought the Muslims. What is two of them, Portier? France. Okay, 50, 60 kilometers from Paris. What happened there? Muslim army arrived from Spain all the way up to, you know, close to Paris, in the interior of France. And Christians beat them back. And since that time, it has become a very important date for the Christians in Europe, especially the French, because 732, they use it as, you know, an indicator that we beat the Muslims, we can beat them again. A very important book from our day. Good. You got a gift yesterday. I'm not going to give you another one yet. <laughs> Wait. Last date. Now we see. 1453. Can we use the term that I would like to use, opening, rather than conquest? Why? You know, it is very important to use the proper words. It's very important to also psychology. Language is culture of people. When you learn a language, you don't just learn a language like some words. It's not words put together. Language is culture, tradition. You identify yourself with people. You learn the language of other people, and you have to also understand their culture in order to understand their language. It's impossible to learn English without knowing anything about Shakespeare. It's impossible to understand English without being aware of what's happening in America or the American culture. Impossible. Because it influences you. And it influences the language that you learn. So, um, I said before, it's good to use opening. You remember, I never say conquest. Opening, like in Arabic, they say, when the Muslims take a place over, we call it opening of a place. Opening for what? Opening for Islam. Okay, so we don't conquer a place. Conquering means, actually, sometimes killing people, blah, 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 but we're not allowed to do that. Islamic warfare is a very important point, by the way. It's another topic that's used to you, that, that can be discussed. But Islamic warfare is something extremely complicated. We are not allowed to, ki to kill young children. We are not allowed to kill women. We are not allowed to kill innocent people. We are not allowed to even cut down trees. Do you know that? In war, a Muslim is not allowed to cut down trees. In war, a Muslim is not allowed to burn agricultural land. Agricultural land. A Muslim is not allowed to kill animals. Okay? Islamic warfare is mighty. It's unbelievable, if you think about it. So if you're talking about human and animal rights, human and animal rights were long there, long before they came to the idea of human and animal rights. Okay? Here, in this part of the world. Now, 1453, the opening of Constantinople. Why is it important? It's a way to Europe, to Europe. It's a prophecy fulfilled. Hadith. Yeah, hadith. Very important. Sorry. Hadith. Yes. Rasulullah was talking about the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, peace be upon him. He spoke about there will be once a mighty conqueror. There will be once a mighty emperor, a mighty army. He was talking about a mighty army that will open Constantinople. Constantinople, several Muslims before tried to open Constantinople since the time of Prophet Muhammad Sassam. Since that time already, they tried it, but it never worked until the time that it had to work, 1453. Okay? Who was the one who opened? 
Okay, Sultan Mohammed or Sultan Mohammed Fatih. Okay, he is called Al Fatih because Fatih in Arabic means open. Okay, like Surat Al Fatih. Al Fatih. And he was not an Arab, right? He was an Ottoman Turk. He was Ottoman. So, up to there. Yesterday, a quick recap. Okay, with regards to yesterday, let's see. Maybe some of you were here yesterday. We spoke about the Americas. Why do we call it Americas? By plural? Two continents. Two continents. Which ones? North and South. North and South America. Countries that belong to the South to North America? North and USA. Okay, very good. USA, Canada, USA, Mexico. Okay. What about South America? Brazil is a very good country. What is the difference between Brazil and the rest of South America? Brazil is the biggest one. Very good. Portuguese, yeah. I don't, I mean, I don't see one person answering. So it's good. Port Brazil is the only Portuguese-speaking country in South America. Okay. And Brazil is the biggest country in South America. Okay. Fine. How come the Portuguese arrived in Brazil? How come the Portuguese went to South America? Yes, sir. Because um, they they couldn't go back into Europe, Europe so they had to go flee to the west. Why couldn't they go flee back into Europe? Europe? That's the wrong word. Okay, why couldn't they go into Spain or Europe, the rest of Europe? Because the Muslims were Muslims, 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 Muslims occupied there and they were independent. Okay, Portugal became independent long before Spain became independent from Muslim rule. Okay, which the Muslims called Al-Andalus. Okay, Al-Andalus. So the whole Iberian Peninsula, which is Spain and Portugal, this was called Al-Andalus. Nowadays, there's a province in the south of Spain which is called Andalusia. But it's not just that area. That area is called Andalusia, but it was not only this. It was the whole of the Iberian Peninsula, nearly the whole. Okay, good, up to there. All right, last but not least, we said something we mentioned about the Muslims in the Caribbean. We did not speak about the Muslims in North America because we ran out of time. But we spoke about the Muslims in the Caribbean. What do you remember? Anything quick that you would like to share with us? Uh, in the African slave Muslims. Okay, so the first Muslims to arrive in America were during the slave trade? Yeah. No. <laughs> Say that again, please. What was what what about the Malian Empire? Mali as far as I know is in Africa. Songhai Empire. Songhai Empire is after this. No, no, no. But the Malian Empire, what about them? So was it trading? They were, yeah, they were trading <coughs> with who, who? Who who be a little specific? Who what? We have some people who were not here yesterday. So what what's happening? Mali was trading with? With the Americans. Okay. So people in Mali Yes. Mali in West Africa were trading with people in the Americas or the Caribbean. Yes, and that long before Christopher Columbus thought of America. Okay, people in Mali. What were the people in Mali? There was one of the biggest Muslim empires, 1,000 years it lasted. One of the biggest Muslim empires. What is so what is so significant about the Malian Empire? Yeah, well, one of the well, one of the richest empires in the world, most probably the richest man who has ever lived on this planet until nowadays with value that we can value nowadays. He was worth most probably four hundred million US dollars as a person. And that transferred to that time. When he went with his people, his slaves, to Egypt for his Hajj, the inflation in Egypt went for 11 years, there was inflation in Egypt because of the gold that he brought into Egypt. Imagine, we're talking about Africa, we're talking about Mali, we're talking about West Africa, okay? People now in Mali are suffering, okay? There was a time when it was exactly the opposite, when in Europe, people did not even know how to use a toilet, okay? And in Mali, we had the biggest library of the world, Timbuktu was a center of learning. We're talking about the 8th, 9th, 10th century. Okay? These people here did not even know what an irrigation system looked like. Okay? And we had in the Muslim world lamps, street lamps in Al-Andalus, in Cordoba. There were street lamps. When people came to study in the Muslim world, 
from England, Germany, whatever else they came, Europe, they went back to their people and said, you will not believe what I saw. I saw light on the street. And people declared them crazy. They said, what is this guy talking about? They were coming back with a hygienic, with ideas of hygiene, how to wash properly. Because for a Christian, that time and now it is as well, I don't know if, you told, if I told you the story of a friend of mine who went to visit a monastery in Greece and he asked to take a shower and he was told, brother, what do you want to say? it's all about the heart and the soul, right? It's not about the body. So, there is an ideology among Christians, Christendom, which actually it did say it's all about the soul. Do everything for the soul. Everything for the heart, not for the body. The body is not important. In Islam, both things are important. That's why it's the ideal deen. There is no other religion, there is no other deen, there is no other faith like this. Combining everything, ideally, no deen does it. Actually, there is no other deen. There is no faith that does it. In Islam, we take care of our outer appearance, we take care of the way we wash, we take care of how we look, we take care of what we put on ourselves, how we go to sleep, how we get up in the morning, how we eat, what we eat, how we drink, and so on and so on. We use the left leg to go to the toilet, the right to go out, the right to, to go to my house, the left to go out, and so on and so on. Imagine, this is a deen, it's an ideology. It's a whole way of life. SubhanAllah, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, it's mind-blowing. If you think of the deen of Islam, then really there is nothing that comes close to it. Nothing. And everything is in, is in Islam. Culture, tradition, language, everything is part of Islam. And that's why you cannot divide Islam from the rest. Okay? So in that case, what we said here now, the Muslim Malians, they had already contact, the Africans had contact with the Caribbean. And Christopher Columbus, his diaries can be seen in. You can look into them. They are in museums nowadays. In his diaries, he describes when they arrived in the Caribbean, they found black people. And they could not understand what are black people doing here. So, this is another indicator, you know, that there was contact between Africa and the Americas before. With the difference, of course, that when the Europeans came, they decided to play superhero. They decided to play superhuman. Because that is a European mentality, and I'm European, double European, more than anyone else here. And I can say these things. We have an ideology, as Europeans, we think that we are better than people of different color, people of different background, people of different continents. Right? Okay? I'm saying, it doesn't matter if you agree or not. Right? Europeans have the idea, have always had this idea. They went to Africa and declared African people, especially the Catholic Church, as people who have no soul. Okay? The Catholic Church. I'm quoting. 1492. Right? Declared the Catholic, the Catholic Church declared African people having no soul. Europeans went to South Africa, implemented the apartheid system. You know about the apartheid system, right? That means black people, white people, Indian people had to live separately from each other. Because white people are superior to black people. That's the ideology. Next to this one, they justify the ideology, which they have racist ideology in the background, with the Bible. And they say, Sam and Ham. Okay? The sons of Noah, alayhi salam. What happened? Ham saw his father naked. Ham, the people who came from Ham, were the African people. So for that reason, Africans are cursed. Now, as an African, I would start thinking. So let me accept Christianity, the ideology which is against me and my people. Okay? And the ideology of superior race feeling people, racists, who come and tell me that if I become Christian, then I can have, drive by the latest mobile or car, I can have the latest house, I can buy a big house, I can become somebody in this planet. You know what? I'd rather die poor than having to accept something like that coming from outside and coming and telling me. I have seen in Africa, you know, icons with blonde, blue-eyed Jesus, who the hell tells me now, honestly now, tell me now, have you ever seen, can you imagine that Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ was blonde, blue-eyed? Do you know where he comes from? You know he was darker than me, most probably. Alright? So, 
Now, good. Next thing. We go on. Let's start today with one thing. Islam in Asia. Any questions with regards to what we're saying just now? Here's one up again. Any questions? So Why is this on? Was that just some uh, black people got into the country? No. Also, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, with regards to, yes, because it was a slave trade from, from Africa to America. But there was, of course, also racism towards Indian people and Asian people. Indians from the Indian subcontinent, brown people as they call them, they always give them nice names, you know, brown people, black people, yellow people, green people, you know. So, I don't know, orange people, do they exist? You know, so they, according to them, people who have a darker color are black people, you know. I, I really wonder, you know, f to me, this is black. I've never seen a person that is that bad. <laughs> you know? So, according to them, it's like, and then brown people are the people who have a little bit Indo Pakistani, you know, features like, you know, brown people, you know? And then there are yellow people, they call, you know, Asian people, Chinese people call them yellow. I don't know what's yellow, but okay, anyway, you know, I, th I think Europeans are a bit colorblind, maybe. So, they have to somehow identify this with color, somehow. Anyway, Islam in Asia. Let's move over to that. Um, yes, when we think of Asia, in this country, we think of the Indian subcontinent. But Asia, my friends, is much, much bigger than just the Indian subcontinent, which is a massive subcontinent, and that's why it's called subcontinent. It's massive. Why in this country, British English calls anybody who comes from India Asian. And Chinese people are called Far Eastern, right? What do they call you? Far Eastern, right? Asian as well, yeah. yeah. They are obviously Asian, but <laughs> but they don't call them Asians. They call them Far Eastern, don't don't they? I think they call East Asian, Far East, East yeah. Asian, East Far Asian. Eastern. I think also yeah. Okay, okay. Far East is for Japan. Sorry? Japan. But Japan, they call it Japan. Okay, they have, okay, mashallah. Okay. Again, as that geographical knowledge again is also a little bit. You know, they have color, they are color blind and they have a geographical problem. So, because it's much much bigger than just you know China. China is a massive country. Massive country, right? But let's take a look at one thing. How did Islam enter Asia? Have you ever seen that before? The Silk Road. That's China, right? This area here, massive area, Indian subcontinent. Now, look at this here. Arriving even further, Constantinople, Rome. Okay? This whole here. This used to be the Silk Road. Any idea what this was? Yeah. Road where they used to do trade. Why is it called silk? Road? Because it main majority mainly had a lot of silk. <coughs> okay, not mainly, but it did start with that. Okay, the idea China was producing silk. Okay, and the silk industry was extremely important. The Ottomans started producing also silk later in Bursa and in other parts of, of the Ottoman Empire. Um, but silk was very important, so that ran. Imagine traders from China used to have contact with people all the way in Europe, Constantinople especially, or Rome, and people from here used to have contact with people all the way, Central Asia, and all this area, massive area of Asia. Now, not only did they exchange products, trade, but they also exchanged languages, culture, religion, civilization. So, if we understand that People in this area, for example, or in this area, or from here, Ar Arabs, they were Muslims, and they would trade with Chinese. Trades people would meet them, like in Africa, you remember, north to West Africa. How did Islam spread to West Africa from north? By trade. Who fought against the West Africans? Nobody. Nobody. There was no battle involved, nothing. Who is fighting the Asians in that case, Silk Road? Who is fighting against each other? Where are the Muslims fighting here? Nowhere. There was no battles. Talking about trade. Okay? This is trade. And trade was more important, and still is nowadays more important than fighting. You know? Now, business minded people. Yes, please. Hi there. Uh, sorry, you just said that. Um, trade is more important than fighting. Right. I just wanted to uh, say, what if trade fighting is a trade nowadays? You said nowadays trade is still more important. 
You're talking about the we weapon industry or the, the uh, you're talking about selling weapons to other people? Fighting, fighting, war, war, selling. What if, what if fighting itself is a trade nowadays? So. Well, look, I mean, if you refer to selling weapons, yeah. then it's a very, very, very bad and bloody game, and a very, very bloody <coughs> trade. Yes. But, and of course, we know that people have to, or countries have to survive on the, on, the, on the trade because of people killing each other. Okay? That does exist. No doubt about it. But what I want to say with that, yes, we can go, it's, it's going too, too deep into details in this. You're right. You're absolutely right what you're saying. But I want to say here, that there is no fighting involved with the spread of Islam, with the spread of cultures in that case. Okay? But what you're saying is absolutely true, spot on. I mean, there is trade. The biggest trade in the world is unfortunately, or the biggest three trades in the world, prostitution, drugs, and weapons. Okay? And they're all criminal, or illegal. Okay. So okay. back in those times, that's what helped uh, Islam spread this truth. Not only Islam, languages, cultures, people, people, go from one place to another, they would migrate. People think nowadays, you know, like the BNP and these idiots, or what are the others called again? Golden Dawn in Greece, and what are they called here again? EDL. EDL, EDL you know, uh, you know these kind of people. You know, they, they think that, we don't want immigrants here. Who wants to come and take my job away? Now, honestly, I can't find work. <laughs> because, you know, who came, he took my job, I can't clean the street anymore. So, his dream when he grew up was to become a cleaner. So, the Pakistani who came over here, took his job away. The same in Greece, we have um, people, you know, who support the Golden Dawn, and they say, you know, Africans come over here and they take our jobs away. As far as I could see, Africans in Greece are selling, you know, products which every Greek is willing to buy because they would never be able to buy a Ray-Ban for 200 or 300 pounds. <laughs> so if you think that this African came over and took your job away, your dream job, then nobody's keeping you back to go to the wholesaler, buy yourself, you know, cheap glasses and go and sell them standing on something. You would never do that, right? Right? So this is not, I mean, there is intelligence and there is minus intelligence. And this is where we are at when we talk to these people. Actually, talking is impossible. Okay? So we see that migration plays an important, played an important role. And that's a better, a better map, actually. Gives you a little bit of a better idea. So you see massive countries of China, India, and in um, Peninsula. Uh, Persia, Arabia, up to Egypt, and going into Europe. You see here, you can see it a little bit better. That's Constantinople, and this is Rome, Italy. Okay? So, connections. And not only that's the Silk Road through Asia, but then we also have connections, of course, to East Africa from Arabia. We also have connections to India, going from India to Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia. Okay? And just a quick one. How did Indonesians and Malaysians become the biggest nation, Muslim nation in the world? Trade. 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 Not one Arab went to fight. No one in Indonesia, a Muslim, went to fight. There was no interest. They were interested in trade. And with trade, Indonesians, and there are some beautiful stories, I don't know how authentic they are, but there are so many stories you can hear from Indonesia that they saw Arabs coming, dealing with them, and telling them, listen, I have two types of material here. This one is better quality, this costs so much, and this one is less quality, it costs so much. I'm telling you, if you want this, you can have it, but it's less quality, I'm telling you that. The other thing is, I heard also stories like, they say, listen, I want, you know, let's say somebody went to buy something and they said, okay, listen, I want honey and bread and milk. You know, a Muslim trader would say, listen, I give you honey, but bread and milk, I want you to go to Ahmed, because he hasn't sold enough today. I haven't done enough. I've done a good job today. I'm happy with what I have. So please go to Ahmed. He's my brother, and I want you to go there. Not brother in blood, okay? I want you to go there, and I want you to buy from him, you know, the rest. SubhanAllah. This is the behavior. Okay? 
This is, we, we have, you know, we are doing history for that reason. I want to learn from history. I want to understand why once there was a mighty Muslim empire, why once the Muslims were actually an example for people. Whole Indonesian nation of 200 million people and more have accepted Islam. The biggest nation in the world, not one fight. The biggest nation in the world of Muslims is in Indonesia. They're not Arabs and they're not Turks. So how come? That's what I'm trying to understand and give through. So now, China, by the way, has a massive amount of Muslims, okay? But because China is such a massive country with the biggest population in the world, right? 100 million go under. You know, some people say 50, some people say 60, some sources say 70, some sources say 100 million Muslims, okay? But we'll come to that in China. Now, Look at that one here. I'm sure that you're all familiar with that, okay? Now, this is the Indian subcontinent. Actually, it's, it's India. Okay? Now, I want to start with that. Who can give me an idea about India? Quickly, some keywords. Throw some in there. Keywords. Curry. India. Curry. <laughs> excellent. Anything else? Chili. Chili. Excellent. Anything else? Huh? Banana. Chapati. Chapati. Anything else but food, you know? Is, <laughs> is there something else that you need to do? The place, huh? Hinduism. The place where Adam, Hinduism. Adam um, descended in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. Is it authentic? That's, okay, no. that's debatable. According to the Indian sources, it's authentic. There's a hadith okay. about it as well, actually. Huh? There's a hadith about it as well. Prophet Sam said, which I. I remember they said some good stuff about the person who goes to take, take, uh, take us down to India. Okay. <coughs> All right. Good. Okay. Hinduism? The Mughal Empire. The Mughal Empire. Thank you. Okay. Guru Nanak. Guru Nanak. Mm -hmm. Okay. Taj Mahal. Thank you. Okay. Now, first of all, the first things that came to mind, of course, because we're living in this country, which is full of Indian restaurants, right? If you go to Birmingham, for example, there's a Spice Road, it's called, by the way. Coventry Road. Not Coventry Road. You go to Spice Road, Spike Hill, and there, there's a, there's a road, you know? Well, Coventry Road has a lot of Arabic and everything also, and Somali shops and everything, but there's one, it's called Spice Road, where they have the best curry in the, in the UK, they say, and according to them, it's the best curry in the world. Okay? So... And you're living in, 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 in cities where it's a big Indian or Indian subcontinental population, you know, from India, from Pakistan, from Bangladesh. As we all know, I'm sure, that used to be all one country. Not country, but one nation. There were no countries at the time. There was no India, there was no Bangladesh, there was no, okay? So all this used to be the Indian subcontinent with a massive amount of languages until nowadays, with a massive amount of cultural and religious differences until nowadays, right? Oh, no, no, it's the religion. Yeah. yeah. So all that until now is massive, absolutely massive. Now, so India. Any idea how Islam came to India? How many Muslims are there in India? Any idea? More than 120 million. They say it's the second biggest population. Some say it's the third biggest population of Muslims in the world. Some say it's the second after Indonesia. All right. So okay, it's not about you know who is the biggest one. Everything is okay. They have a massive amount of Muslims. How come? You mentioned Hinduism before. When I hear India, also, I think of Hinduism. What is Hinduism? Look at the name. Hinduism. Hindu. What is that? Yes, sir. Very true. In Greek, which is a very important language, because Alexander the Great, by the way, went all the way there. In Greek, you know, India is called India, and the Indian people are Hinduistes, or Hindu, you know, people from that area. Hindus, if you want to translate it into English, you know. In South America, you know, people living in South America used to call the Indian contract workers, you remember we mentioned that yesterday? First, when the Europeans arrived, they went to Africa, they killed all the native inhabitants, right? And then they went to Africa, got slaves from Africa. After the, the abolition of slave trade, 
they had they needed the Europeans couldn't work themselves, of course, they wouldn't get their hands dirty. So they needed somebody else to come and work for them. So they needed from the inferior people to come and work for them. Who did they go and get? Indians. Indian contract workers. What do the people in Suriname or in Guyana or in Brazil call, call these people? Muslims or Hindus alike? Hindustani. If you go to Suriname, people call all Indians Hindustani. Okay? So, it's an indication of location. It's location. So now these people are called Hindus who actually follow this religion. So this religion or this type of faith is local specific. It has to do with the locality. So it cannot be a universal religion, right? If it is something that has to do with locality, then it has to do with people living in that area. So a Hindu, a Chinese Hindu, is actually not possible because according to their understanding or according to the understanding of this word, linguistically, it's somebody from the area of Hindustan, you know, the area where the Hindus come from. And this is Indian subcontinent, right? So the religion... Hindustan is including uh, part of China? No. No. It is mainly India, as we know it nowadays, okay. India as we know it nowadays, going into Bangladesh Hindustan, and going and Pakistan. That's about it. Uh -huh. Okay? Sri Lanka actually also. Yeah. Because this is the Punjab you call No, but the Punjab is up here. Look, look, Punjab. This is an area, a region. It's called Punjab in India. And in Pakistan. Uh -huh. Okay? But all this area is in well, Indian subcontinent. Okay, subcontinent, all right? So, um, yeah, what was the last thing I was saying? Locality. Locality, okay. So, Hinduism is actually not a universal religion in that way. So, we can actually already, because you know what I'm saying there, because there are people who say, how do you know Islam is right? How do you know, how can you choose between all these, between all these millions of religions? Millions of religions? Which one? Hinduism is one of them. For me, it's a tick already, or a cross for Hinduism. So if you have to choose among the religions, then Hinduism cannot be part of this that you can choose of, because it's a local religion. Like so many other religions are local in Africa or in Asia. So it's not a universal one. And Allah, God, is a, universe, is a being that is talked to all, talk to, has talked to all his creations. So in that case, Hinduism does not belong to that. So it cannot be a right thing. The same Buddhism. What is Buddhism? But don't mix it up. Eh? Hinduism is something else, Buddhism is something else. Uh -huh. So it's not Hindu or Buddha or whatever. Buddhism started after the Buddhism. Buddhism. Yeah. Buddhism. Yeah. Yeah. Buddha. Yeah. Yeah. That one is not Hindu. No, that's Buddha. Buddha. Buddhism. Okay, that's another religion. That's Buddhism. But it came originally from India. It came originally from India. Most of these religions came from India. Okay? The question is if Buddha himself was maybe a prophet, like many others. That might be, right? And he never said, make a Buddha statue and worship me. Right? So that's another question. But anyway, so Hinduism and Buddhism, and here you see India better. That's India. That's not the country of India. You see Pakistan there? You see Afghanistan there? This is Nepal, this is Bhutan, this is Bangladesh. Okay? And China up here. So they have borders with China. So, all right? Now, um, I actually asked before, have, do you have any idea where the first mosque was built? When and where the first mosque in, Isla in, in India was built? Bab Babri Masjid. No, 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 look at the point. Down here. Kerala. In Kerala, there is a place called Malabar. And the first masjid ever was built in 629 in Malabar. 629. When did our Prophet Muhammad die? 632. During the time of Prophet Muhammad, during the time of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, there was a mosque built in India. That means there was connection already with India during the time of Prophet Muhammad During the time of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, there was also a connection between one of the kings, the king of the Chera kingdom, he met the Prophet in Arabia and accepted Islam. 
And he went back to where he came from, Malabar, and had the first mosque built there. So he met Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu himself in Arabia, Indian, an Indian king, and he went back, accepted Islam, and went back and had a mosque built there. He was a king of a kingdom. A very important point here, because according to Indian Hindus, Islam, you know, came to India by salt. Okay? So point number one, 629, an Indian king himself went back and had a mosque built because he accepted Islam after having met the Prophet Muhammad Point number one. Point number two, we'll see that after this first mosque was built in the south, because coastal areas, the Muslims used to go there, the Arabs before Islam, they used to pass India also on their way to Indonesia. Okay? So they used to stop there as well. But when they became Muslim, they gave through also with their trade also Islam. But you know, again, as I said, these were traders, business people. They were not interested in people converting to Islam. But they accepted Islam because of the akhlaq, because of the way that people were behaving. The traders were people, not like nowadays, not like Muslim not traders nowadays, or Muslim, Muslim businessmen, that you have to make sure that, hey, you know, you get your money back. Mm -hmm. Not these people. You know, we're talking about honest business people at that time, who Asians looked upon, Africans looked upon, and they say, wow, these people, they are something special. They have something special. What do you guys have? Listen, I'm a Muslim. I don't lie, I don't cheat, I don't steal. Really? And according to this, they don't just say that. They act upon it. Today, Muslims say, I don't lie, I don't cheat, I don't cheat. And exactly the opposite is happening. Okay? There used to be a time when Muslims would say, look at the Muslims and you know Islam. During the time of the Sahabi, they used to say, look at the Muslims and you know Islam. Now, scholars say, do not look at the Muslim streets. Okay? Look at Islam. Okay? So, unfortunately, it's just the truth. If we look further into this one, we mentioned this one. Look at Buddhism. Buddhism came also from India. It spread throughout because of trade. It spread throughout Asia because of trade. Again, but it was long, long before Islam came. So there were Buddhists already living in Indonesia. And that's why now it's on the Java Island, there are Hindus and Buddhists living. Because of that time. Because there was contact, contact with Indians and with other Asians. And then when the Muslims came, they accepted Islam. Again, again, there was no battle involved. People in Asia accepted Islam, and Islam took over in many religions, in many regions, like in Indonesia, but okay? Now, now during that time, <clears throat> 600 AD, that's the time of our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he was making the da'wah in the Arabian Peninsula. During that time, do you recognize anything important on this map here? Something that is important for us to know? What is happening during the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, being active in Mecca? What is happening in Asia? Mecca is here, Arabia is here, and look at here, we have the Persian Empire, the Sassanid dynasty. Okay? We have the Gökturk Haganet, which basically meant the Turkish people, the Turkic tribes. And that's where Turkic people come from, from Central Asia. Turkic and Turkish people come from Central Asia. And everybody following them, the Mughals, for example, were also Turkic people. The Mughals in India, their origin is in Central Asia, the same origin that Turkic people have, the Turkish people have. Okay? Now, look at India. India is totally divided into different, very many different type of um, Nations, empires, whatever. You see that? Divided, totally divided. That was in 600. During the same time, you know, the Muslims came and they established themselves. Some came from the north, which is in the case of Sindh, which is a province in Pakistan. Do you see that here? Karachi was the capital. Okay, that's a province in Pakistan. And they established themselves actually there in the north, but also, as we saw before, in the south, because of trade in the south, coastal areas. But the north, up there, there was no trade. Okay? And they came and they fought. There we have fights. Okay? 
The first territorial expansion happened under Caliph al-Walid 705 to 715. And the Muslims went into Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India, not India. So yes, there the Muslims fought against the Hindus and against other people. But this was when? 705 to 715. When was the first mosque built in India? 629. How many years between? Nearly 100 years. 80 years. So within this time, Islam still was spreading, but it was spreading because of trade and relationship that was there. And the first real fights happened during that time, beginning of the 8th century. So now, if a Hindu comes and tells you, like they do, you know, Islam came to us, the Muslims came, they suppressed us, and they forced the religion upon us, then I would think carefully. We have something to say here now. It's not entirely true. It was an Indian who established the first mosque, it was an Indian who established Islam in the south of India. It was an Indian who actually spread Islam first. Right? Next to this one, we have Sahabi like, like Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, Uwais al-Karni, or Sa'd ibn Zaid. They all arrived in India in 615. And they did not fight. They went as Da'is, as people to spread Islam. Okay? 615. And then they went to China in 616, 617. So these two countries, and that's why we're going to focus on them very much, China, 616, 17, and India, 615. That's when the first Sahabi went to. Okay? The first followers of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, they went to India in 615, and then they went to China in 616, 617. These countries were extremely important. SubhanAllah. I, it, it breaks my heart when I look at Chinese developments nowadays, and you look at these youngsters, you know, second, third, fourth generation youngsters, you know, being dressed in um, leather, rocky, like rock, you know, this kind of, you know, Western type of people wanting to copy the West. What the heck do you Chinese have to copy the West for? When you were writing, these guys were on trees here. When you were having irrigation systems, these people did not even know how to read and write. They did not even know how to write letters. They had no letters here. And now Chinese are following these people. What for? India. India. What a country. What a culture. What a civilization. They used to be the Muslims during the time of the Abbasids. They used to have contact with the Indians. They went over to India, and they would do what? They would take Sanskrit literature in Sanskrit, which is the original language, right, of India, Sanskrit. Have you ever heard of that? Yes. Sanskrit. Can you see that one? Sanskrit. That's the original language of India. Okay? From this language, everything else developed. Many Indian languages, Urdu also, as well as no other languages, Hindu and so on. So, they used to, Muslims used to go to India and take Sanskrit literature, medicine, astronomy, astrology. They would take from the Indian Hindus and they would go back to the Abbasid, to the to Baghdad, and they would have everything translated into Arabic and in other languages. Nowadays, you have Muslims telling you, oh, subhanAllah, you take from the Kufar. You take from these non-believers. You take from this Kufar. You know, look, Islamic civilization at its highest point was when there was contact with other civilizations, when we were learning from others, and when we accepted to learn from others. Okay? Now, Indian literature and Chinese literature was at the highest peak point, actually, in the 7th century, 8th century. Papyrus comes from Egypt, right? But what about the first writing? What did the Chinese, the compass, the Muslims brought the compass to Spain. But where did the Muslims get it from? From China. The Muslims brought the number zero, which in German is called Sifa. Look at this here. Zero. There was no zero in the mathematical system of the Europeans that time. Okay? until the Muslims brought the zero over from where? From India. 
Nowadays, what do we call these numbers? One, two, three, four, five. What is it? We call them Arabic numbers. Why do we call them Arabic numbers? Because the Muslims brought them to, Spain, to, to Europe, to Spain. But actually, the Arabs write what? One, two, three, four, and so on. These are the Arabic numbers nowadays, but actually they are Indian numbers. Yes. These are the original Indian numbers that the Arabs use. And these Arabic numbers are the original numbers that we use them in Arabic, but actually they're Indian. Now, they used to copy and translate Aristotle, Plato, Sophocles, big Greek philosophers. Nobody would say, what are you guys doing there, taking from the Kufar? What are you doing there? We would take philosophy. A Muslim would be ready and willing to sit down and translate books from Greek philosophers, Persians, from Indians, from um, Chinese, because they saw in there that there was useful stuff. There is something that we can take. And this is what Islam is. Islam is not what people make it nowadays. And I would like to come back to an unfortunate incident of today. I'm not standing here to justify anything. I have nothing to justify. You know? Absolutely nothing. But, I don't know if you have heard what happened today. Fair. Unfortunately, in France, again, you know, another incident, you know, which involved see many Muslims. Okay, I think, uh, how was it, 15 people got killed? Anybody know what happened? Different got killed, four got injured. Sorry, say that again? 12 got killed. Some says 10, some... Uh, BBC says 10, I think it was 10. No. Okay, forget BBC, what did Jazeera say? <laughs> <laughs> Jazeera says 12, around that number, so between 10 and 12. <laughs> <laughs> we just saw the video. There is a video. We just saw the video. Yeah. It doesn't okay. show shooting, we just... <laughs> we saw the video, okay, what video do you see? Two videos. <laughs> oh, so they showed you some people going in and out, but I saw many videos like that. Okay, but okay, what exactly do they say? It is what they say, but they know, we have no idea what happened, what they tell you, but what, ex what do they say? So they say some people, or somebody went crazy because of some cartoon or film, what is it again? Something that had involved Islam again. Now, for months again it was quiet, right? For months it was quiet. You know what? I feared it would happen again because that's how it is. When it's quiet, we have to come up with something again to make sure that our biggest enemy now, you know, has to be looking back. Because, hey, imagine what we're learning here. And what we, if you look back in history, if you look at actually what Islamic civilization meant, it has absolutely nothing to do with the way they're portraying it nowadays. And I'm not talking just about non-Muslims. I'm talking about the so-called Muslims as well. Okay? People who come up there in the name of Islam and do things, all right, if at all. But again, we have to be careful what we know. We don't know a lot, so what do we judge, okay? So, unfortunately, this incident is again something to um, make them aware that, hey, the threat is still there. So, we have to see what's going to happen. Just a reminder, you remember we spoke about Al-Andalus some time back? There used to be once a time, Al-Andalus, Spain and Portugal, used to be part of the Muslim world for how long? 700 years, not seven, not 70, 700 years. How many generations is that? Do the maths, you're better than me. Now, how many generations of Spanish Muslims, of Portuguese Muslims, how many Muslims from that time have survived? 21. <laughs> no evidence in Spain or Portugal, except of some buildings, you know, of the Muslim families, okay, of people from that time. You want to really tell me 700 years, not many Muslims in Spain, you know, not many people accepted Islam, you know, Arabs came over and then they left after 700 years. So anyway, just to make, a, it's a very, very important point, okay, a very, very important thing, you know. Unfortunately, these things will happen, happen and will happen again, will happen again, I'll tell you that again. But I do not know where it will lead us. You know, if you look at this civilization, high civilization that existed in Europe, and one, in the, and one of the highest in the world, for 700 years, in Spain and Portugal. It was not a Christian, it was a Muslim civilization. And it was Christians who would go and study as you come here to study here. Mm -hmm. They would go and study the universities in Spain and Portugal, and even in North Africa, okay? And the first universities in the world were actually established there, in North Africa and in Spain, okay? And that was the rule. So now, 
Um, hopefully this will come once to a good end, but I doubt it. Um, let's move on. So Pakistan sent, you know, again, part of India, of the Indian subcontinent, give you some nice pictures just to get a little bit of feeling, the idea of what we're talking about. Now, this is a mausoleum in Karachi. Hey, for the Muslims, for the Europeans to keep Muslims back, because this is something we don't know. You know, don't imagine that for 300 years the Europeans would go to Africa, get African slaves, take them over to America, and everything was fine and nice. There were revolts in between. In Brazil, Brazil had most revolts ever. Until 1910, there were Muslim communities and there were mosques in Brazil from the north to the south, established by African Muslims. Mm -hmm. Revolts happened in Brazil, revolts happened in the Caribbean because of Muslims. How? Not because they were super intelligent, but because they could communicate with each other. And yes, they were educationally more advanced than the rest of the slaves. Because the empires, the Muslim empires in Africa were ruling. So most of them knew how to read and write. Most of them knew all Arabic, so they could communicate in Arabic because, hey, Africa, as we said again, is not one country. Okay? So different tribes, different people, they could not communicate. But a Muslim from Senegal and a Muslim from Nigeria and a Muslim from Ghana could communicate on the ships with each other in Arabic. And that's what forced later the Europeans to say, no, make sure you don't take Muslims anymore. Why? Because these guys create trouble. Okay? The only ones who could revolt were the Muslims. Because they would call out for jihad. They would be the ones to actually tell, be able to communicate, to plot against the Europeans. They were the ones who had a common culture. They would hide in the evening and make salah because they weren't allowed to. They would be whipped. Some of them were killed just because they were found praying, Islamic prayer. Their children would be taken away, put in Christian schools to educate them. And nowadays you have the Caribbeans, you know, African Caribbeans, being in churches, you know, and praising Jesus, you know. And my question is, you know who gave you that? You know how you were given through? You know how this was given through to you? Your ancestors suffered, suffered, because you were, you were supposed to pray, to worship a blonde, blue-eyed Jesus, who you now, as, you know, you are the one who is now justifying what you're doing. You are the one who is keeping now this alive in Africa. These guys, Christianity is dying out in Europe, and in Africa is striving. You know, there is a very nice quote once, and there are different people who said it. They said, when we were in Africa and the Europeans came, we had the land. And they had the Bible. They told us to close our eyes. And when we opened our eyes, they had the land and we had the Bible. Very true, isn't it? Very true. China, massive country. Massive, import, massively important. High civilization, high culture. With a lot of admiration, I really talk about this country as well as India. Long before the Muslims were there, there was Chinese culture flourishing. Okay? So, I really, it breaks my heart as non-Chinese to see Chinese people copying the West. What is there to copy? Madonna? Malcolm X? Michael Jackson? What is there to copy? What is there to copy? You know, I really wonder, you know, I used to, you know, in Germany, where I, where I went to university, we used to have contact with some Chinese and Indonesians, quite a big community in Aachen, where I used to go to university. Now, and you would talk to the Chinese, and you would say that, you would see that they are quite mad. They came to Germany four or five years, doing their masters, and going back to China. Mashallah. They would go there, they would be among themselves, they would just meet themselves, and go back to China to give through, you know, technology. Germany, guys, not in England, you know. Okay, Germany. Now, they would go back to China and they would implement what they have learned in Germany, which is very intelligent. But then you would still find in between them some who would say, I would like to stay here actually, because there's more freedom and, you know, because here we have more um, yeah, freedom and uh, we can do what we like here. You know, why can you do what you like here exactly? What do you mean when you can do what you like here? You know, you know th th that's the way that they grab you in your countries. They say that you don't have freedom of press, freedom of speech, freedom of whatever, because we have it here, right? So they don't have it over there, so now you have to fight for your democratic rights. So China is in turmoil now. China has a problem. 
because there are some elements within China who think that, you know, they have to implement the democratic system, which is the only system in the world, according to them, you know, which they have to implement to China in order for China to prosper. Have you ever heard of the Boxer uh, Rebellion in China? The Boxer Rebellion? What was that? No? 20th century? Beginning? No? The Boxer Rebellion? They were fighting all these, when these Europeans came in, the opium trade, what was that? The opium trade? Nice. You've never heard of the opium trade in China? Yeah. Who brought opium to China? The British. The Europeans. The British, of course, but also the Portuguese and the Spanish and everyone. You know what one of the British guys said? One of the parliamentarians, MPs? He said, as long as the Chinese are a nation of opium, um, opium addicts, we fear nothing from them. Make them addicted to opium, to drugs, then we are fine. We are fine. Then we can operate freely. SubhanAllah, this is so true, isn't it? Have you been to a black neighborhood in America? Have anybody ever been to America? Go to a black neighborhood in America. What do you see in a black, black neighborhood? What is the first thing that you see? Sister, what do you see in a black neighborhood in America? Graffiti. <laughs> Sorry? What kind of shops do you find first there? Liquor stores. Supermarkets? Liquor shops. Liquor shops. Liquor, 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 guns. Oh! Liquor, 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 guns. In America, you can go and buy guns. Free. That's, you know, you go to Australia. You go to Aboriginal areas. You know, they have them in their reserves. You know, like we do in zoos, you go to zoo. Have you ever been to a zoo, you know, where you have, this is a panda bear, this is a camel, you know, this is that. So you go to Australia, yeah. which nowadays, according to many people, Australia is a white cowboy country, right? You know, the original Australians, the real Australians, you know, which is one, one and a half percent, live like, well, if you can call it live, they kind of are somewhere in Australia in their own zoos, reserves. And if you go there, your heart breaks, and you see them the way they live. You see people all drunk. You see the men totally drunk, the women totally not taken care of, Having two, three babies to, to, to run around to take care of, you know? SubhanAllah, do you see what, you know? <laughs> and then you tell Malcolm X, our brother, mashallah, may Allah keep it really, SubhanAllah, maybe in, in Jannah. Malcolm X used to say exactly that that time, and nothing has changed from that time. Nothing of what he used to say has changed, guys, nowadays. I believe 100% in his words. I believe 100%. He has seen what happened. He saw it that time, and nothing has changed. When he was talking about these guys, they want you to drink. These guys, they know we will kill each other. They know we will kill each other, he was saying about his community in America. Okay? And the only way to get them out of the system, killing each other and getting drunk, was to get them some kind of respect for each other, some kind of organization and system. And that was Islam. That was Islam. The only way to get them back to become human beings. Okay? And wherever you go, in South Africa, the same thing, by the way. It's just that there are more black Africans, so that's a bigger problem for whites to keep them quiet, you know? So. But that's why Islam is in. We'll speak about it on the 20th, inshallah, or whatever that is. That is true. Islam is not, they don't care about you praying, guys. They don't care about you hiding in rooms and reading Quran the whole day. That's not what they're interested in. They don't care. We do it the whole day. We don't care. But as long as you keep out of the system. The system is based on interest, the system is based on drugs, selling as many drugs as possible, make you an addict, you know, the system is based on an elite filling their pockets, and we create a problem as Muslims, because in Islam, we're not allowed to have elites that's filling their pockets. Okay? We're not allowed to be unjust in an unjust way. So, the spread of Buddhism that we saw before, again, Buddhism spread, also like Islam in that way, um, and the different empires, quickly going through the Chinese empires, we have the Tang Dynasty. In 700, there was the Tang Dynasty in China. The Tang Dynasty in China, anybody in here? About the Tang Dynasty? Okay, what have you heard? Uh, they overruled uh, 
hand dynasty, isn't it? Or is before the hand dynasty? Um, was during the time of the spread of Islam, during actually shortly after the time, uh, during the time of, 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 of Prophet Muhammad when he was still alive, from 618 to 906. Okay? This is something I would not remember. But just to, you don't have to remember the exact date, but 618, right? 618. So, it's still during the time of the life of Prophet Muhammad, 618 to 906. That was the Tang dynasty. Okay, dynasty in China again, like in all other places, parts of the world, the dynasty is ruled by a family, right? That's what it means, a dynasty. Now, during that time, Islam was brought to China already, as we said before, Saad ibn Makas, and many of the Sahabi had gone right to China and they spread Islam. Now, just 10 years later, 11, 629, the first masjid was built. Okay, the first mosque. The Tang dynasty, the revenue was the silk road. The Silk Road played an important role for the Tang dynasty, right? And the first Muslims in China were actually Arab and Persian merchants in a bigger scale. Um, they were, as I said before, rather interested in trading than in propagating Islam. They did not go there to make dawah or to propagate Islam. They were there for business, okay? But <clears throat> an interesting point here to remember quickly or to look into: in 845, 200 years later. The Chinese ruler issued an anti-Buddhist edict. The anti-Buddhist edict was against the Buddhists in the country, not against the Muslims. So there was a time once when the Buddhists were the bad guys. And the Muslims were not. So the anti-Buddhist edict in 845 made the Buddhists the bad guys, okay, and he did not, he was anti-Buddhist. But he was not necessarily pro-Islamic, but he let the Muslims be. Um, there were big Muslim communities of traders and merchants in the port cities of Guangzhou, for example, Guangzhou and Hangzhou, in the southeast, but also in Chang'an, Kaifeng and Yangzhou in the interior. So if you look at China, during that time, we had at the coastal areas, Muslim communities living, but also inside here. Okay. The next dynasty that comes after the Tang, is the Song Dynasty, Northern and Southern Song, okay? And as you can see, the Northern Song from 960 to 1126, and the Southern Song from 1127 to 1279. The Song Dynasty, interestingly enough, Muslims had become an established element in Chinese trade. Everybody knew Muslims at that time, especially in trade. It was normal to deal with Muslims. More than 5,000 Muslims from Bukhara, which is now in Uzbekistan, you know Imam Bukhari, where he was from, were invited to settle first in China's northeast and then between the sun capital of Kaifeng and Yanqing, which is Beijing. Their leader, Prince Amir Sayyid, is called the father of the Chinese Muslims. During that time, Islam was spreading even much more in China. And nobody could keep it back. Nobody was interested in keeping it back. There was no interest against it. Now, after the Tang Dynasty, the Song, sorry, the Song Dynasty, there is the Yu. There's again, okay, another map of the Song Dynasty, um, and then, okay, the Yuan Dynasty. The Yuan. Mm -hmm. Any idea? Maybe the Chinese. Do you know who was the Yuan Dynasty? Who was that? Any idea? Good, Mongols. The Mongolians went to China. And they captured China for, uh, from 1271 to 1368, nearly 100 years. The only non-Chinese rulers in China, the Mongols, for that time. Okay? Um, and what happened to the Muslims at that time? The Mongols were not Muslims at that time. They not only allowed the Muslims to spread freely, but they were given special status and privileges over the non, over the Han Chinese. 
So suddenly they become important, more important in the empire than ever before because the Mongolians were nothing else but some kind of barbarians. They couldn't keep a country together. So they needed administration. And who was best to administer the country in such a massive country? The Central Asian Muslims. So they invited them in their country more than ever before. And they were put in administration. And they were ruling China, actually. The Mongolians were the warriors. But the Muslims were doing the writing work. And this was during the time of the Yuan Dynasty. After the Yuan Dynasty, we have the Ming Dynasty. Okay, oh, there we have Yuan again. Okay. Okay, it gives you a bigger idea of how, during the time of the Yuan Dynasty, that's what the world looked like at that time. Um, the Mongols were ruling actually most of Asia at that time. But the Mongols were divided into these type of groups or tribes. The Mongols were one, two, three, four different dynasties. The, the, the Mongols in China were, were the Yuan Dynasty. The Mongols in Russia were the Golden Horde. The Mongols in Persia, in this area, well, Afghanistan is Chagatai, and then Persia, Ilkhanid. So even the Ilkhanid, even the Persians later, they were actually from that area, okay? They were also Central Asian Mongols, okay? So that's how they were divided that time, during the time of the Yuan dynasty. The Mongol Empire went into Europe, right? Massive empire. But as I said again, they could not take care of it themselves. They were not, administ they were not administratively administratively, they didn't have the skills to do that. So, we, we, we heard at that time that uh, Genghis Khan, he controls half of the world. Yeah, Genghis Khan, one of the first ones, yeah, he was basically, he controlled, yes, up to Europe, from Asia all the way, all the way to Europe. Yeah, Asia too, yeah. Short time. Yes. Yeah, in a very short time, that's true. Uh, the Ming Empire, the Ming Dynasty, a quick one, the Ming dynasty allowed many mosques to be built and to establish a real Islamic infrastructure. Under the Mings, okay. Islam spread even further. For some historians, this period is considered to be the golden age of Islam in China. Islam and mosques were flourishing in the capital cities, Jijing, I don't know if I say it right now, and Nanjing, as well as in Yunnan, Fujian, and Guangdong. <laughs> Muslims were influencing the government while the founder of the Ming dynasty, Zhu Yuanzhang was surrounded by Muslim generals. Six of his most trusted generals were Muslims. SubhanAllah. We're talking about China, right? Everybody, when you talk about China, you think of China, Buddhist, you know, whatever you think about China. Have you ever thought of Muslims being behind the, the, the development of the Chinese economy, Chinese culture, Chinese um, 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 policy? Okay? Now, the Qing dynasty of the Qing Empire was actually of the last one, 1644 to 1911, until the revolution. That was actually the last big dynasty that was ruled by the Manchu people, who had to deal with a lot of Muslim revolts in various places. Things started becoming a little bit more different, difficult. But still, there was Muslim power, still they were free to practice their religion, still the Muslims were actually in the country, and, t and they even well, they even helped and worked together with the government. Certain ones of them, as we said, China is a massive country. Now, certain other tribe, tribal issues that influence the, com the, the community relations, you know, some Muslims in the north had a problem with something, so they would revolt. But Muslims in Shanghai or in Beijing would not have such an issue. They would work together with the government. They were business people. Now, during the so-called, the one that I mentioned before, the Boxer Rebellion, there was a Muslim army led by Dong Fujian fighting for the Qing dynasty against the foreigners. Who were the foreigners? The Europeans. British, Portuguese, Spanish, French. They invaded China under the pretext, you know, as it happens in many other countries nowadays, you know, they need to be invaded for security. So, when they invaded China, the Boxer Rebellion by the Chinese people against the foreign invasion, Boxer Rebellion was supported by the Muslim Chinese. They fought for China. They fought for China. Okay? Oh, you can't see that, sorry. 
push it into the side. I think everybody knows where Portsmouth and this is not <laughs> Push it into the side, okay? So the box everybody. <clears throat> and last but not least, of course, the People's Republic of China, where the total mess appeared. Mosques had to close down, churches had to close down, religion was the opium of the people. Um, destruction for any kind of religious society and community in China. This, of course, changed the attitude towards other people. Maybe, psychologically, because of the influence that they had experienced from foreign people, they thought they made it, as I said before, they made Islam look as if it was, as if it was something from outside. So we have to protect Chinese values from the outer appearance. Does this sound familiar? We have to protect Chinese values from these Muslims. You know, some people say now we have to protect British values and European values, you know. So let's keep the Muslims out. They don't have part of us. Although they were part all the centuries before. All the centuries before the Muslims were part of China until now. Now things have changed a little bit in China, but still we hear suppression. Still in the Hugo province, in Xinjiang, for example, in the north of China, we hear that people during Ramadan are not allowed to fast. We hear also that school children have to go to school and have lunch at school during Ramadan. So there are many, many issues that we hear nowadays still, you know, and there is still suppression there. Because China is China. I mean, there is a lot that um, would influence their development. And I think they have to still learn how to deal with foreigners. And they have to still learn because of their experience, because of their rich, massively rich culture, and a history, you know, which they have the right to go back and be proud of and, and learn from, but they have to also learn that there are other people outside of China. And Chinese are not the only people on this planet, and they're not the only civilization in this, in this world. So, there is a little bit this issue there <coughs> that the Chinese and the Indians had such a massive civilization, but incorporated into the empire and civilization, incorporated Islam. And in India, more so, Indian rule meant Muslim rule. From the Delhi Sultanate in the 14th century, even earlier, up to the Mughal Empire. The Mughal Empire in India, and I'm not going to talk too much about the Mughal Empire, there's so much that needs to be said. The Mughals were Muslims until the British came. Okay, they were ruling until the British arrived in India. Okay, now, we had people under the Mughals, for example, like Aurangzeb, the last one, well, Shilyo, no, the, last, the last of the big ones, he was uh, a pious Muslim, okay, and he would reintroduce the jizya. Whereas before him, Indian Mughal Muslims would not take jizya from the non-Muslims. There was a certain emperor who would actually come, he had come up with a new religion, a mix of Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism and everything, okay, and, you know, a very weird situation, okay. And this is what you can see, you know, you can see where all this leads. Okay, if you don't follow Islam, you can see where all this will lead in the end. Now, up to there, I spoke a lot today, actually. I did not, I was not intending to do that. But, we are great, we are great on time. Any question, anything you want to answer, uh, ask. So, the box of the rebellion was, right? Exact day. No, no, but it's not the exact, the exact year. Oh. Not the exact year. But it was in the 1900s, okay? I don't know the exact year, but I can check it for you. Shall I have it here? I have it here. Just don't have it. Here. I'm sorry about that. I'll check it for you, inshallah. The exact day, I don't know. The exact year, I don't know. But it was in the 1900s. Okay. Anything else you want to add? Yeah, um, yeah um, it's just the uh, religion of Afghanistan. Yeah. And you said earlier that Islam got to Afghanistan by a war. Like that, is we... No, 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 you misunderstood me. Okay, it was Islam.
Islam in Central Asia was spread because of Sufi teachers, Sufi sheikhs. Right. Okay, they were walking around Central Asia, well, according to um, Sufi teachers, a mystic kind of teachers, right? For the people who don't know. And they would um, take it upon them to basically walk around villages and go to people and educate them and teach them about Islam, according to their understanding of Islam. And many, most of the Turkic people, including the people in Afghanistan, accepted actually Islam like this. Not to but let's get it. Okay. The Ghaznavid Empire was much later. Yeah, I know that, yeah. Okay. So, thank you for the clarification because indeed sometimes people might think that go out with something that they misunderstood. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, you know, I like said uh, Islam went to China through trade. Yes. Um, I read before in, on the internet that um, Osman went to, at the time of the Prophet, I think it was, he went to China. To like a con, uh, like a convoy to spread the message, and the emperor, of Ch the Chinese emperor at the time, he lacked Islam, and he basically, I think, he built a masjid as a project. That him. is true. There was once one, one of the emperors. I don't know what it was. That is very true. But he allowed at the very beginning. Actually. Yeah. He allowed him to build the mosque. You know. Um, I don't know how close he was to Islam. I mean, the source and other here. He was a Muslim, but he. The emperor was not. No, he wasn't Muslim, no. but he said it makes sense. Yeah. He is a mosque. You know, that is true. That is true. It happened, right. The mosque were built under this. You know, you couldn't, you wouldn't be able, you wouldn't have been able to do anything without the permission of the uh, emperor anyway. Mm. So, yes, everything happened under the definite permission. And I think he condoned, like, uh, killing, like, any violence against the Muslims as well. Mm. Yes, there was a lot, there are a lot of incidents. I mean, I showed before, and hopefully this will be distributed, inshallah, to you. There was two newspaper articles that I have here, and one of them is talking about, now I hope I'm saying it right here, Shanghai, okay, who was actually a Muslim um, um, navigator, okay, and he was China's most famous navigator, living in 1371 to 1435, and most probably under him, they, the Chinese, Beat, of course, again, uh, Christopher Columbus to it. In 1421, they probably arrived in America. Okay? Under Shane. Okay? And he is written, just to make this, I, I don't know how to pronounce it, the brother before he, uh, I was corrected. So his name is? Zhenghu. Say that, please. Zhenghu. Zhenghu. Like this, okay? Around. So he was a Muslim, and there is a book written about him, 1421. The year China discovered America. He was a Muslim general. So Columbus was in 1492. 1492. Well, Columbus. 80 years. Yes, of course. The Vikings were there before. Everybody was there before Columbus. But in the end, in the end, you know, Columbus got the, got the roses, right? No. So, in the end, you know, a very important point. Why is it? Because the source, you know, there was an there was a relation. We have to see that the Muslims of that time, as I said before, they would take sources in Sanskrit from the English. They would take sources from the Chinese, and they would learn from each other. The same Chinese and Indians were not perfect. They also learned from the Muslims. Okay, they learned. There was an intercultural exchange, guys. We we were living in times once when the Muslims were living with other faiths and other religions and other cultures and they were thriving with each other. You know, in contrast to nowadays that we think that people cannot live with Muslims or Muslims cannot live among non-Muslim societies. Wisdom is the lost property of the believer and wherever you find it you have more of a right to it. So that's probably where it comes from. Very good, man. Yes, we can take, exactly. Why I'm insisting on this here now is because there are nowadays people, Muslims, who say you cannot take from non Muslims. You cannot take from their sources. This is nonsense. As long as it doesn't go against your, your deen, our religion, we can take from them. Okay? Medicine, you know, why would we have been if we hadn't taken from the Chinese and the Indians and from other people? Where would we have been? Right? No. <coughs> Before we finish, again, an appeal to all of you, inshallah. I'm here now standing, and all this is financed out of my own pockets. So please, if you can support me, I have three of my books here, again, with CD, with DVDs, okay? 
Now, a book costs uh, 10, 10 pounds, three of them cost 25. And I got a new DVD, which is uh, The Three Astonishing Ottoman cap Capitals. So, about the Ottoman uh, cap Bursa, Edirne, Istanbul. So, it's a little bit a uh, travel guide and historical guide together. So, the DVD is five pounds, and the books with the DVD are 10 pounds. So, please, inshallah, if you can support me with the work that I'm doing, so that we can offer these courses for free, we go on offering them, inshallah, um, feel free to come and uh, take a look at what I do. Mean. Okay, thank you very much. Hope to see you tomorrow. Tomorrow, we're coming back to the UK, Australia, and UK. Mm -hmm.